I'm Nick Wright. I'm a first violin in the London Symphony Orchestra and I have been for the last two and a half years. Uh, I'm English, obviously, and uh, I'm from the north of England. And um, I'm here today at New York University. I just did a class and, um, and I'm doing a little talk about uh, people who might want to get into the creative and into a creative career. So. I started when I was four, which is, yeah, it's recommended, I would say, to start as early as possible. So that was good for me. I had a very, I was very lucky. I had a, a great teacher who, who really, uh, who really taught me a lot and, um, and took a lot of time with me, which is important. And it um, wasn't always easy. I remember my mum and dad fishing my violin out of the bin every every day after practice when I was about six or seven, I think. But um, I'm very happy that it's all worked out well. I went to college, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship, and f since then I, I joined the orchestra and that's, I'm here now. So it's been quite a fast roller coaster, really. Well, my parents are both musicians, which helps, but it's not essential at all, I would I'd say. Uh, it, uh, I think you have to be interested in it. Um, I was lucky enough I played the violin which which I loved from an early age. I listened to lots of recordings. Uh, I had my heart set on playing certain pieces. You have to have some initiative yourself rather than being told to do it. Uh, and um, you know it, it can be really fun. I mean after a while the better you get the more rewarding the practice becomes because you can hear results sooner. Uh, I know it's frustrating when you begin because you're making a sound which you don't particularly enjoy. Perhaps uh, the people in your family don't particularly enjoy it either. Uh, but that's something you have to go through in order to get the benefits, which, which can be huge. So you have to persevere. It's, it can be tough. Well, it varied, varied a lot. I, I can't remember how much I used to do when I was, when I was four, but um, I remember whilst I was in secondary school, I like, probably did about five hours a day uh, and through college similar if I could sometimes things get in the way uh, it's important to just do focused practice rather than a massive amount there's no point in tiring yourself out it's much better even if you can just do half an hour a day it's much better than uh, of quality practice is better than two hours of 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 useless sort of playing through things, not thinking. It's much better. And regular practice is better than doing two hours here and then having three days off, of course. Unfortunately, unfortunately for me now in the orchestra, it's difficult to have a, a routine that you can stick to. Uh, sometimes we work long days, sometimes we work short days. So it, it's difficult. I, I always start off with some warm-up exercises. It's very important. Uh, you have to get your fingers going, your, your hearing going. I tend to do some slow, slow scales and slow chords. And um, from there, I think it's good to do some exercises before you start your, your pieces. Uh, I'd also say don't try and do too much in one, in one session. Limit yourself and try and make it right. It's better to perfect something rather than be average in many things. Technique is only a means of achieving what you want musically and that's what it has to be. Uh, I don't find any interest in listening to something which is just purely technical and not musical. There has to be a, a goal behind working technically. So it's really a case of how do I want this to sound and if it's not sounding that way, that's a technical problem that you then fix. There has to be a musical goal. Um, yeah, I, but once you've discovered that technical problem, you have to focus on that until you find a solution. It has to be, it has to be so many things. Uh, very, it was very encouraging. Um, but also very strict. Um, I knew that if I turned up for my, for my lesson, I hadn't practiced enough, I was going to get in trouble. That's important. You have to be strict. Um, having, 
but he uh, he was encouraging. He put me into lots of concerts early. He gave me as much performing opportunities as I needed, which is hugely important uh, from an early age to do that. And he really you you have to you have to let the pupil grow in the in their own way. Uh, my teacher was great. He never. He never insisted on his on his way, on his fingerings, on his specific ideas. It's good that he he gave me them as an option, and from then I could choose them or or reject them. That's very important because no one's the same. We have different hand sizes. We have different different musical ideas. So he was. You have to let the each student grow differently. Common mistakes, I would say, is the basics, the fundamentals of playing in tune and in time, uh, especially rhythm. Rhythm is, is so key. Uh, even I would rather hear someone with great rhythm to begin with who couldn't play any of the notes than someone who can play all of the notes but has no, no pulse, no rhythm. That's really, you have to establish that before you can add any gloss to it. And that's what some, lots of, lots of youngsters fall down on. Uh, they, don't, they don't get the basics sorted. They want to move on to other pieces or they want to learn vibrato. This stuff is all, all added on top of the basics, which is playing in tune and in time. Obviously, playing with a good sound is, is crucial, but that's, that's, more personal uh, so that's that's more an interesting thing the basics have to be learned very different very very different um, as a soloist you're you're free to do a lot more so you're not restricted by uh, by 15 other people playing the same line as you uh, you're free to experiment more it's it's, it can be more rewarding in some ways, and it can be more scary. Uh, I think it's, it's most people's dream when they're learning an instrument to be a soloist, and it's great, it's great if that works. Um, it's, it is very different to being an orchestral musician, though. You, uh, it, it is, you know, you have to blend into a section in the orchestra, you have to you have to be aware of what's going on around you a lot more um, and fit in. And uh, the life of an orchestral mus musician is very different to uh, a soloist. Um, but I like, I like both, actually. And, uh, and there's, there's the in-between, the chamber music, piano trios, quartets, which are very rewarding. So there's a lot of choice. I think I've, I've given up my initial childhood dream of being uh, an international soloist. And I'm absolutely fine with that. I think uh, it takes a special type of person to do that. You have to be prepared to uh, lead quite a lonely life at some times. And um, the, unfortunately in classical music, recording contracts are very thin for individuals or groups, so no, that's not something I'll be pursuing. Although it is very good to record yourself, if you can, and any opportunity and listen. You hear some, some things that you don't think you do. It's a good experience. For a start, I would say there's nothing wrong with listening to great players and picking up ideas. I, I used to listen to so many recordings, and um, somehow I'm sure that fed into my brain and, and it comes out in the, in, in the playing, hopefully, uh, ideas of what they do. And so, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't reject that as an idea. Um, I think it, you just have to take each piece as it comes and say, what does this mean to me? And how can I express what the composer is is trying to do, has written on the page. It's very difficult to look at a whole load of black dots and make something out of it. 
but you have to use a lot of thought. Uh, just sitting down and looking at the score, if it's a concerto, looking at all the different parts of the orchestra as well, and uh, that can really help. And from there, you just it's a natural progression. You'll find things that you like, things that you dislike. You'll come up with a interpretation of your own. Everyone is going to find a repertoire that they're more comfortable with, I think. Uh, for me, I, I, prob I probably tend to uh, play romantic and uh, neoclassical works. Those are probably my favorite. Um, and I find them the easiest to, to get to grips with. Uh, Bach is a, a minefield, really. Um, it's extremely important to play it, whether you, you like it or not. Uh, I think everyone finds that about the same. They'll find some things they're more comfortable with. But it's important not to reject the other things and to try and improve on that. Everyone has their favorite conductors, conductors the least favorite. Um, that's, that's human nature, and uh, it's not a bad thing. Uh, in, in my orchestra, we have very many conductors conducting us. In, so we have a huge range. Some I like tremendously, some I dislike, and some you uh, you just you just let them pass. They don't offend you or uh, or gratify you. Um, I don't want to name names, but when you have um, a great conductor, you feel it. Uh, the whole orchestra feels it, and um, they. They produce such a different sound, and uh, it's not all about technique. There are some some conductors with huge, hugely amazing techniques, which I admire beyond belief. But they have to have some something, something more than that to offer. Um, and someone like Colin Davis, he is uh, he's special because he. He, he lets the orchestra play with so much uh, breath. He gives us time, and um, that's, that's, that's kind of, you don't find that very much. To annoy us, they can, um, they can either rehearse excessively, which then makes the piece stale, or the other extreme, they can be very lazy and not rehearse at all, <laughs> which then leaves us very stressed because we don't know the piece well enough. Those are probably the most annoying characteristics. And um, I think I always find there's something in great conductor's eyes that I don't know how to explain it. I would say the one one person who I just get so much from just looking at their eyes is Hytink. It's just stunning. He, he just he can say everything about a phrase in his eyes. It's tremendous. Um, they have to have good technique. It's it's important. Otherwise, it's not together. It's like playing in tune in time. The conductor has to has to let let the orchestra have the basics by putting the stick in the right place. But apart from that, it's this, there's an X factor which you look for. I guess my heroes are Heifetz and Rabin. Um, different reasons, really. I mean, Heifetz is the one violinist that I think probably if you ask most, they'll say. Uh, he's just, uh, without doubt, untouched by, by any following him. I'm previous to him, possibly. Uh, such a huge technique, such, so incredible, and um, such a sound, such a unique sound. You can put on a CD for two seconds and know it's Heifetz. That's, that's why I like him. Rabin, he was not very well known. He's, he's, uh, he's, unfortunately, he died rather young, and um, he was phenomenal as well. But uh, he hasn't really received the recognition, I don't feel. Then my favorite living is Gil Shaham, who he's been my favorite for many, many years now. 
and uh, I guess he's he's the one that I really remember going to concerts. Uh, before that was Perlman. Um, he's he's one that is in my my generation, so I can relate to him and and hear him in a concert hall. I was never lucky enough to to hear the other two. There's not actually such a huge world of classical music out there in terms of uh, stepping up the ladder. Uh, once you're in a, I'm lucky enough to be in, in the orchestra that I am in. Um, I think from there you just, you get the benefits you, you, uh, you, which are more than financial, let's say. I think uh, it's one of the things that you have to sort of just deal with is the fact that you're never going to make as much money as uh, a, a banker or you know some some someone who owns a I don't know a casino or something. But uh, it's not about that. It's about it's about the music. It's about doing something which you love, which is something probably everyone everyone keeps saying. Oh, you're so lucky you do something that that you love that, that was a hobby, whatever. And that's that's very true. I mean, I quite a lot of the time I don't feel like I'm working when I when I'm at work. So that's a nice way. That's a nice way to feel. I would say explore any any avenue. You know, don't be afraid. Be confident. Um, don't shut yourself off to any option. So don't say, oh, I'm only going to play in a quartet or I'm only going to be a solo violinist. Uh, I think that's dangerous because it might not happen and there are other things that that are out there that can be equally rewarding. Uh, if you have the opportunity to perform anywhere you should take it. I really strongly believe however many people you play to it's good, it's a good experience um, to get to deal with stage fright, to deal with these these things. So I would take any opportunities you can, and uh, don't be afraid to make a fool of yourself too. <laughs> and uh, you know, just you know, approach things with your own heart and your own musicality, or whatever, whatever, whether you're an artist or whatever, do what pleases you because there's no point otherwise. You have to. That's what musicians are. They they don't follow uh, a set sort of uh, textbook. That's why it's such a varied and amazing career to have.